Well, that would be great because <clears throat> recently they asked the Dalai Lama about the uh, Middle East and the problem there, the Palestinians and Israelis, and they said, what do you think we could do? And he said, well, we could invite them on a picnic, but just don't let them talk. Because the moment <laughs> they start talking, and this is where it gets into belief systems. I wrote a book called To Believe or Not to Believe, The Social and Neurological Consequences of Belief Systems. And it's about some of the consequences of our organized religions, our politics. We, we have divided ourselves up in, in such a, a state that we can, we can no longer communicate. Even what we're talking about right now, we haven't developed the, the language, the, the linguistic capabilities of really defining what we're saying. But you and I can talk about it because we sort of grok in a Heinleinian sense what, we, what it is we're trying to speak of. But people that are really stuck into these entrenched belief systems they're not only, only stuck in the old language that really defines them, they don't even understand what's going on on these higher conscious levels. How do you think that this is going to work? I mean, it seems like we're all sensing that the peace that we're looking for out there <clears throat> needs to come from within inside ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like we're racing against time. Do you think that yeah. there is a, a, a natural time clock and we shouldn't be too concerned with that? Or do you think that this is something like Carl Sagan was saying, that maybe the reason we don't hear from a lot of technologically advanced societies is because during their technological adolescence, they blow themselves up. And I think <laughs> this is the concern of a lot of people right now. What, what do you have to say in reference to that? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Well, I think there's no doubt that we're in terrible crisis and that, um, you know, we're in crisis in every regard. And it has to do with the kind of mindset that we've had, this very individualist thinking, this what's in it for me, get ahead at any cost, elbow out the, the other guy. That whole mentality is bringing us to the brink of extinction. But what I also think is there are methods that we can use to start learning how to speak with each other over our beliefs that are really important. I speak about them in the bond. I mean, there's a guy who's called Orlin Bishop who is using them. And he's working in an, in an area that would be considered an exercise in futility. He's working with rival gang members in Watts. Los, South Los Angeles. And Watts, remember, is the place of two incredible race riots that nearly burnt itself to the ground. With these gang members, and Watts is also the home of, you know, the notorious games, gangs, the Crips and the Bloods, he's getting rival gang members to sit down and communicate with each other using techniques from Africa. Um, and his technique is called Subona. And it's very much, it was it was slightly, you know, it was used in a sense and in, um, in Avatar, the movie Avatar, um, when the Navi say "I see you" and the other one says "I see you too." That's sort of like it. So Bono means literally "we see you" because Africans never believe that seeing is a solitary act. You see with your relatives, you see with everyone around you, and the others say "Yabo so Bono," I see you too, or we see you too. We see you all, me and all my relatives see you back. Um, and what he's talking about there is making a connection that honors the relationship above being right, above belief, above anything. And so it's a very big change of perspective because right now when we relate to people, we mainly relate for personal gain or because we are just like that person. We, want, we see people just like us. And we don't look for what we need to do to make the connection. We don't think of what do I have to be to help this other person to flourish. I mean, and that's what Bishop is really suggesting you do. So getting back to Bohm again, it very much, um, it very much parallels Bohmian dialogue because Bohm, as you know, being a student of him, was very much somebody who believed that our discussions and our and what passes for discourse is usually just belief systems, one belief system coming and jarring against another belief system. 
and that what he wanted to do was to kind of create a more of a collective mind. And, and he talked very much about beliefs being just a cultural construct. So he talked about people learning a, to slow down and to stop winning arguments or trying to prevail over someone else and simply put them at service to the dialogue, allow them to express their deep beliefs, allow someone else to express their deep beliefs. Everybody listens respectfully. Everybody checks inside for how they're feeling. Nobody makes judgments and then see what happens. Now, perfect example of this was at Planned Parenthood and in Cambridge a few years ago when, um, when uh, somebody, a few people at Planned Parenthood were shot and um, the, both sides of this very contentious belief system, the pro-choice and the pro-life, decided we better get together. So they got together in secret, they carried out this kind of dialoguing where they were talking very deeply about why they believed what they believed. And after a while, what ended up happening is the pro-life people ended up watching the pro-choice people's backs and letting them know if there were more attacks imminent. And at the end of this time, they held a press conference, revealed what they had done, and the press asked them, so who won the debate? And both sides said, no one. We both came to believe more deeply in what we believe because we were able to express it so fully. And so the reporters said, so it must have been a failure then. And they said, no, no, no. Now we go out together. We watch each other's children. We party together. We love each other. So this kind of opening yourself up, change of perspective, allowing yourself to be at service to the relationship, considering that first over your own primacy and being right and prevailing, allows that, allows the connection that's always there, despite any different beliefs, to come to the fore. And that's what we're talking about, a connection below these beliefs. Yeah, I think the example you just gave is a, a pretty good example of the, how our beliefs really aren't beliefs based upon facts usually they're it's a perceptual belief it's the way we see life because of our society how we've grown our life experiences and if we were in that other person's shoes we have to recognize that we would have adopted their belief more than likely because what we do is we we get identified with our beliefs and, and we say, I am a Republican, I am a Baptist, I am a, an American. And we get so heavily identified with that that we feel like we need to protect it and defend it. And if that doesn't work, then we need to be offensive with that in order for it, which is what we've identified with, which means me, to survive. And I, and I think if we can just get to the point where we can recognize that another person's point of view is valid, even though we might see it as lacking moral judgment or moral depth, if we can embrace that, it's like the old saying, seek first to understand, then to be understood. It sort of takes the fire out of a person. It, it takes that need to defend if they feel like they're at least being understood, even if you don't agree with them. Absolutely. That's the whole thing. Is, and the other thing is not minding if you don't agree. You know, in order to like someone, you don't have to agree with them. Um, I found this at a conference where I was speaking to the only Republican at this event. And he had been insulted. I had made a joke about one thing relating to Republicans, and then I'd made a joke at another point about something relating to Democrats. He was very sensitive. He felt very much like the odd man out. So he told me about six months later that he'd been very offended by what I'd said. And so we, I sat down and made a point of spending a lot of time with him. And we realized we had a total, we could make a total connection despite very, very different beliefs in a lot of areas. And I think that's the point, is the understanding that, you know, you the connection's always there. The connection is, nature has designed us to connect, even with the most disagreeable among us. There is that impulse always to bond. And, you know, you, you can live with a paradox. Um, there was a wonderful example of this with 
um, Don Beck once again working, I believe it was uh, Don Beck or it was Mark Gerson who works with the UN and he works in, again in areas of conflict. He was working with a group in, in the same area in the Middle East and um, he found that both the, he, there was a group comprised of both Israelis and, and Palestinians and he said to them, how can you work together so well? And they said, well, we can live with paradox, and we've learned to live with paradox. And so he said, well, how, and what do you mean by that? He said, okay, let's take, let's take the birth of Israel. We'll both write a paragraph on it. One of the Israelis, one of the Pal Palestinians. So the Palestinian writes the disaster, and he writes all about how terrible it was that the Palestinians all lost their home homeland, and they were made to be refugees, and all the, you know, the aggressive Israelis, etc. The Israelis wrote the historic establishment of independence, and they wrote about how brilliant it was that the UN had sanctioned the space, the historic place where the Jews had a historic right to their homeland, and that despite the fact that they were beleaguered from all sides from the moment they moved there, um, the, the Israelis very bravely defended their nation. And here's the problem, both sides are true. Both sides are absolutely true. And this is what this group has recognized, that almost always there's some element of truth in every side, in every belief. And so the real important point is to take a more aerial perspective, as I put it, where you, when you recognize the bond, you're more likely to be able to sit above it, any side, and to understand the real connection that exists despite it. Yeah, I think the aerial position that you're talking about is a little bit, Joseph Campbell mentioned one time that his concern with religion as it is today is that it, it's so entrenched and so the gap is getting so much greater between religion, which actually dates back to the Iron Age, and our scientific information. And as that gap grows ever larger, his concern is that we would end up trashing religion altogether and lose the motif, the mythology around that. And sometimes I think what we need to do, instead of letting that happen, is create a larger myth that we can all sort of congregate around. And I think the larger myth would actually be planet Earth in this case. Mm -hmm. We really mm -hmm. need to come up with a mythology so immense and so inclusive that mm -hmm. we could all get behind that because I, I don't think there's too many people on the planet that wants the planet to be destroyed although there are some and yes. th these are some of the old religious beliefs that are actually becoming dysfunctional and unfortunately have become dangerous with advanced technology but I think yeah. if we could all just sort of congregate around this idea of the earth and saving the earth I think it would be a myth that we could all resonate with and maybe that would override a lot of these divisive myths that we've been coming into conflict with.